An excerpt from the Declassified Galactic Survival Guide. To speed along its ever-growing borders, the Sun Empire has to have the biggest and bestest fleet in the galaxy. And to have the biggest fleet in the galaxy, you need scores and scores of willing applicants. And thus comes the other area of expertise that Nerox wields like a fine blade. Propaganda. It is much easier to inspire hordes of faithful followers if you tell them what you want them to know, rather than what they should know. And that's what the Imperial Sunfleet does. Goes around giving inspiring speeches in small towns throughout the galaxy. Dazzling, impressionable youth with shining medals and gold bands on their sleeves. Who wants to be a farmer when you can be a Sunfleet captain? Sail the stars on a battle cruiser larger than your entire town? See the whole galaxy? Protect the weak and meek and be a hero. And every year, countless teenagers flock to Nerox, hoping to earn a commission in the illustrious ranks to the Imperial Sunfleet. The real kicker, though, is that less than half of those starry-eyed recruits make it out of Enzyme, and fewer than that even make it up to the helm. Because what Nerox is searching for isn't your ability to do your job with any degree of proficiency. It's how good you are at following orders and not questioning them. They're only about ten hours into their thirty-six-hour trip, and Tubbo has already decided that if he has to spend a single second longer than required with Prince Ronbu the pretentious and long-winded, he's going to fly them into the nearest sun. The little shit has already complained about practically everything on the Asachi, from the color palette to the lack of space bitched about the bunk Tubbo pointed him to with little fanfare. And if it was literally anyone else, Tubbo would feel sorry for them, because Rambu can't even sit on it properly without banging his horns into the ceiling. This is absolutely ridiculous. Rambu snapped, where he was bent nearly in half. And Tubbo didn't know what the fuck he wanted him to do about it. Fucking remodel the Asachi while they were in hyperspace? So he shrugged his shoulders and repeated one of Techno's adages. Them's the breaks. After enduring an impassionate rant about how that had to be breaking Imperial OSHA guidelines for spacecraft, Tubbo made up some bullshit excuse that he needed to go check on things and beat a hasty retreat to the cockpit, waspishly mouthing along to the talking continuing behind him. He'd plotted a direct course to Nerox, and after checking that everything was running smoothly, because he was a good pilot, Tubbo just kicked back in his chair, swung his legs over an armrest, and absent-mindedly fiddled with a puzzle cube in the relative peace and quiet. Since the mission was now officially underway, Tubbo wasn't worried about running into any Sunfleet cruisers, because if he got pulled over, he could flap his mission papers at them, and as soon as they saw Techno's horrendous scrawl at the bottom they'd back right off. Or, alternatively, he could just throw Ronbu at them and jump back into hyperspace while he talked the Sunfleet brass to death. Tubbo has never met another being that talked quite as much as him. It would almost be impressive if it wasn't so fucking annoying. And it never stopped. Like he was trying to fill up empty space with how great he was, in case you'd forgotten in the last couple of seconds of silence. He was probably just used to having courtiers around that fawned over him. Servants that had no other choice but to smile and nod and make him feel special. And Tubbo was committed to at least being civil, but he wasn't going to kiss the brat's ass. Hey, pilot, your ship's Wi-Fi isn't working. Speak of the devil, Tubbo thinks with a snort. Barely holds back a sigh as he calls. That would be because I don't have it. Seriously? Do you have any idea how expensive it is? I can't afford that. Tubbo shoots back, without thinking. Forgetting that, duh, of course he's got no idea. He is a prince from one of the richest planets in the entire galaxy. Probably can't name the price of a single item in the Asachi if his life depended on it. I've got a deep space transmitter, if you need to make a call or something. I... No, thank you. Rambu sounds a lot closer than he has been, and Tubbo sits up in apprehension, sees him hovering outside the entrance to the cockpit. Fancy-looking hollow tablet clutched to his front, 
tail uncurling and curling around one of his legs. There is nothing Tubbo wants less than Ronbu in his cockpit. Just touching things with his stupid long fingers and sniffing in disgust at everything. Figures if maybe he plays along, he can get the asshole to leave him alone. Making an assumption after seeing the tablet, Tubbo turns back to his cube and adopts a very apologetic tone. If you need to download something, you're going to have to wait until we get back to Nerox. Sorry about any inconvenience. Hmm? Oh, no. I was just doing some reading for class. I'm at the top of my grade, you know. Scored the highest out of anyone in their second year at the academy last term. He pauses for a second, likely with the notion that Tubbo's going to praise him or something. But when he doesn't get any reaction, continues on at a fast clip. But this year I'm going to do better than the entire student body combined. I'll outscore all of them. Yippee. Tubbo says in deadpan, entirely absorbed in rotating the tiles on his puzzle, hoping Ronbu will take the hint and go away. But even with his lackluster response, Ronbu is not deterred in the slightest. I'm going to graduate early. No one's managed that for my major yet. It's a very rigorous program, by the way. One of the toughest at the academy. But I'm going to be the first. I might even go back for a second degree, because how hard could it be, really? Queen's past, shut the fuck up, Tubbo mouths silently to himself, the hands that aren't fiddling around with the puzzle cube, digging harshly into his sides, making him wince when he accidentally grips his left side too hard. But there's pent-up aggravation tingling throughout his body, and it's either dig his fingers into himself or start yelling. And then after that, I'll apply for a consulate position in Hey, are you listening to me? I, I'm trying to have a conversation with you. Though maybe that's my fault for assuming you know anything about the Academy. My apologies, your highness. But I'm trying to fly a spacecraft here. Tubbo snaps, throwing the cube down into his lap out of frustration, easily catching the implication that he's not good enough to get into the Sunfleet Academy. Twists to look around his chair and jolts, when he sees Ronbu's wandered into the cockpit and is standing behind the co-pilot seat. Tubbo has the sudden and horrible image of the royal brat sitting his glittering ass down in his co-pilot seat, chokes on the spit in his mouth, because no one has ever sat there, and no one ever will. The only person that Tubbo would ever want a thousand light years away, and he already said no. But thankfully, Ronbu remains standing, just looks down to how Tubbo's sitting, eyes flicking between the brightly colored cube in his lap to his legs thrown over the side of an armrest, and then up to where the autopilot is clearly visible on the HUD, looks somewhere by Tubbo's head and arches a brow in disdain. I'm so much better than you, that look screams. You're the dirt under my heel. And Tubbo's fingers clench to the point of bruising on his sides, Never were going to be anything. The roiling mass of searing hot anger rising in him like a backlogged engine block. A nobody going nowhere. It's really complicated stuff. I won't bother you with an explanation, your highness. Tubbo simpers, batting his lashes at him, and he's expecting Rambu to bitch and rage. Maybe throw out some petty one-liners. But he goes absolutely still. Body untensing in the weirdest way. It's like any personality he had is gone. And Tubbo's pretty good at reading people. You have to be to survive in this line of work. But he can't get a read on Ronbu at all anymore. Like he's completely void of emotion. Not a single sign of life in him. Ronbu tips his head to the side, with a vapid expression, disturbingly bland and congenial smile on his face. Naturally, I imagine it's quite hard simplifying your entire craft down to its most basic essentials, especially when it's something you are so familiar with, both inside and out. I... what are you getting at? Tubbo snaps. Feels like he's missing something here. And finally sits up to face Ronbu properly, who merely shakes his head. Nothing but blank disinterest in his eyes. 
Nothing at all. I'm simply expressing an understanding of the limitations one such as yourself must subsist under. Uh, right. Teppo trails off uncertainly. Brows scrunched together because it really feels like there's some conversation going on he's not aware of. But after he repeats what Rambu just said a few times to himself, his eyes go wide. Wait. Wait, are you calling me stupid? Oh, I would never. What a terrible thing to say. Rambu says, in a hollowly polite voice, turns on his heel without so much as showing a single sign of a comprehensible emotion. Sweeps out of the cockpit with an airy, I'm going to try and rest for a while. Do work on keeping us on a stable flight path, if you can. Tubbo watches him go, with his mouth hanging open. Heat rising on his face with how angry he is. And as soon as the door to the sleeping area swishes closed behind Ronbu's stupid golden heels, Tubbo hunches over, fists fingers in his hair and screams soundlessly. Queens of fucking ages past, he hasn't been this blisteringly, achingly, completely all-encompassing furious in such a long time that he's a little lightheaded. Hasn't felt this out of control since he still had gold bands on his sleeves and wasn't his own person. He... he needs to hit something. To feel the sting in his knuckles and get some of this poisonous hate out of him. But they're in the middle of deep space, so there's nowhere for him to go. And Tebo's not about to unload his frustrations on the Asachi. Feeling trapped and panicked and pissed off, he fumbles his hand held out of his pocket with shaking hands and just begins typing faster than his enraged mind can keep up. To Dickhead, you wouldn't believe the amount of bullshit I'm having to deal with. This new mission is driving me up the fucking wall. I can't. And this fucking dick has the audacity to tell me I'm not good enough for fucking Sunfleet, like they're not the actual trash of the universe. And he treats me like I'm some fucking backwatered idiot that just jumped in a flight seat and hit the ignition. I'm going to kill. I'm actually going to kill him, and the jail time will be worth it. Tubbo lets out a shaky breath, and lowers his hand held, and he's still upset, hands tremoring faintly, but some of the frantic urgency to do something is gone. Tipping his head back against his chair, he takes a few seconds to calm down. Breathe in. Breathe out. You're okay. Breathe in. Breathe out. It's fine. You're fine feels a faint vibration, and snaps his head down immediately. From Dickhead. Go off, I guess, King. You doing another supply run? It's... It's like midnight on Nerox right now. But Tommy must still have it, so Tubbo's messages always go through to his handheld. Even when it's in sleep mode. And he huffs out a tremulous laugh, because Tommy knows him so well. He begins typing out a response. No, escort this time. Client super rich and super spoiled. Damn. What the fuck's he like to piss you off this much? Take every entitled dick in top brass times ten. Holy fuck. Rip you, I guess. I am suffering. Help me, you dick. Wanna call? Swiveling to check that the door at the end of the Asachi is closed, Tubbo types back, yes, before going in and lowering the volume for the video call preemptively. Make sure it's only coming out of the speakers in the cockpit, and not the whole ship. A second later, and the horrendous, scrunched face picture of Tommy is up on the HUD, and Tubbo grins, already feels some of the tension bleeding out of him as he hits accept, and then the entire cockpit is flooded with that too loud, boisterous voice. Hello, bitch! Hey, dickhead. Tubbo sighs happily tucking his legs up under himself while Tommy grins at him, camera way too close to his face, and giving him a weird, fish-eyed look. And Tubbo cocks his head to the side. You in bed or something? Yeah, because I just got done fucking bitches, Tubbs. It was off the wall, you have no idea, man. You got a PT test tomorrow? Tubbo interrupts with a cheeky grin, and Tommy clicks his mouth shut, thuds his head back against his pillow, muttering sulkily, no. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> Sucks to be you. Tubbo crows, enthusiastically flipping off Tommy with all four hands, while he struggles to just get one free where he's trying to keep his hand held steady. 
The video feed pitches around wildly, Tommy biting out curses as he tries to write it, snapping over Tubbo's delighted cackling. Oh, would you... Shut up, you ass. You've got it worse than me if you're spam texting me this much. With a groan, Tubbo sags back in his chair, jerks around quick to make sure the door is still shut, and whispers as loudly as he can. You've got no idea. I'm... He's really just the worst, Toms. You can't even begin to imagine. Is he worse than Corporal Danza, the old pissbag? Oh, man. Fuck that guy, but yes. I didn't think it'd ever be possible, but somehow he manages. Tubbo seethes, hands flying around while he rants, getting swept up in his frustrations. He's so spoiled. Thinks everything should just be fucking handed to him. Can't shut the fuck up about himself. It's insane. Uh, and on top of everything, he's so rude. Queen's past, he's like, bitched me out the first time we met because I didn't use his title properly. Oh, for the love of creation. And he refuses to use my name. Just keeps calling me Pilot. Like I'm some sort of servant or something. Tubbo gripes. Hadn't realized how much had been bothering him until he'd voiced it. But now he can't stop thinking about it. How Ranbu acts like he's not even worth the energy it takes to exist. Huck. Queens, I just hate him so much. Like it's so bad, Tommy. Just the way he talks to me. It's... It's like I'm back there. Tubbo stops himself before he can say any more, eyes suddenly stinging, and he ducks his head. Thought he'd stamped all of that down, that it wouldn't be coming back up, but here it is, crawling to the surface with nasty little claws that sink into his mind and threaten to drag him back down there. Calm down. Get a hold of yourself. Sit down. Shut up. Do as you're told. Fuck! Fuck! He barks, banging his palms against the armrests, completely and utterly infuriated to the point that it feels like he's choking, like there's hands clenched around his throat in a stranglehold, and, and there's empty canisters at his feet, the scent of fuel raking in the air, a match passed to him, but there's not. You can't go back there. You've got to calm down, get a grip. Remember what happened last time. No half measures. A wounded, overly concerned noise trickles in through the speakers, and Tubbo latches onto it, tries to stop thinking about the woozy smell of fuel and the acrid scent of chemical fires, focuses on the smooth cadence of Tommy's voice as he starts speaking. I'm so sorry, man. I just... Fuck, I'd punch him right in the dick if I was there. Mark my words. Tubbo lets out a shaky breath, looks up, through bleary eyes, and tries not to sniffle super obviously. Because he isn't going to cry over this. Not because of stupid motherfucking Ronbu, Prince of Dicks. Tommy just smiles at him sadly, like he knows what he's thinking. Says softly, It's gonna be alright, Tubbo. Just try and keep away from him. And I know it's hard, but don't let him get to you, man. You're the best pilot I've ever known and smarter than half the idiots in our my class. This dickhead doesn't know shit. You're only saying that because you know I'd shoot you otherwise. Tubbo mumbles, scrubbing the sleeve of his bomber across his face. Little bit of joyful pride kindling in his chest when Tommy barks out a startled laugh and cackles. Uh-oh, big man over here with a scary gun. Looking back up at the image of his best friend's grinning face, stupidly warped by how close the camera is to him, makes such intense longing spike through Tubbo that he feels like the wind's been knocked out of him. It hits him then, the fact that he's going to be on Nerox tomorrow. We'll get to see Tommy in person, real and alive and in front of him. And he must make some sort of face, because Tommy asks with a hint of worry, You all right? You look like you just went really still. Yeah, I, um, I didn't want to, um, you know, jinx anything, but funny story, I'm actually going to- Tubbo stops short as an alert screams through the cockpit, and he jerks, hitting a few buttons on the console that'll minimize the video feed. Pulls up the windows for his instrument readouts and feels all the blood leave his face. 
Oh, fuck. Tomo, what's wrong? Tommy's voice is barely audible over the shrill wailing of more alarms sounding, and Tubbo unwinds frantically from his coiled position, hands steady as they fly fast across the console despite how hard his heart is pounding. Tubbo? Uh, I, I have to go- Fuck! A siren just went fucking supernova. Tubbo yells, the Asachi shaking around them as they're hit with the first pulsating shockwave sending the video feed crackling into shrieking static. But Tommy's face pops back up, eyes blown wide in panic. No, no! Fucking no! Tobo, you- Tommy screams, whatever he was saying cutting out as the Asachi is hit again, metal plating groaning as they're forced off their path a little, and tubbo has got to drop them out of light speed or they're going to be ripped apart in hyperspace. He eases back on the throttle, Engines winding down as the bright blur of hyperspace is replaced with the searing, red-hot light of Osiren in the distance. Thick bands of burning gases snarl off the surface of the star as it shudders, outermost layers expanding and contracting quickly as its core collapses, sending sheets of molten hot metals spitting out into space around it, and Tubbo swallows thickly. He spares a quick glance at Tommy and it looks like he's going to throw up, tears collecting in his lashes while his eyes dart all around the screen. But Tubbo feels a strange amount of calm flood through him as he grins shakily, winking. <laughs> hey, I'm the best pilot you know, remember? You stupid... It's be okay for the... Odd, please... I love... Tommy's breaking up too much as the radiation leaking from Osiren interrupts the transmission. And Tubbo's got to go. Needs to have all his attention focused on keeping them alive. Yells in the desperate hope that Tommy will be able to hear him. Love you, Tommy. See you on the other side. The feed cuts out with a sharp crack before he can end it himself. And Tubbo takes a shuddering breath as another shockwave hits them. Bits of debris from freshly destroyed asteroids streaking past like small, fiery comets. This is bad. Tubbo's never been this near a star when it's gone terminal like this before, and it's going to take some really tricky, really smart flying to get them out of this one. Dearly departed queens, uh, I know I'm not the most, uh, devout, but I could use all the fucking help I could get right now. Amen, or whatever. Tubbo hastily fires off, switching all of the controls over to manual, and takes command of the Asachi. Fearing them sharply to the side as another barrage of debris comes hurtling past, alarms blaring throughout the entire ship as they're swarmed with radiation. A chunk of asteroid roughly the size of the Asachi comes barreling towards them, blasted off its trajectory by a guttering wave of energy from the expanding star, and Tubbo hauls back on the throttle, flinging them into reverse and barely skating by its surface with a heinous scrape of metal. He misses the door swishing open amidst the noise of everything else, but it's still not a surprise when Ronbu is suddenly yelling behind him. What do you think you're... D d uh, ancients of the Deep? What's... Osiren went supernova! Tebo calls back, jerking the yoke to the side and spinning around a smattering of red-hot chunks of nuclear hot metal. Here's a loud thud and squawk behind him. You're gonna want to buckle up. He meant in one of the seats in the main cabin, but Ronbu stumbles his lanky ass further into the cockpit and drops into the co-pilot seat, buckling himself in with quaking hands, and Tubbo looks at him a second too long in the eerie red light, indignation breaking through the calm his mind had descended into. At least, until Ronbu flings a hand at the viewport and screams, R rock Tubbo whips back around, loudly cursing as he's too slow maneuvering out of the way, and cringes at the rumbling, tearing sound that shudders through the Asachi, throws the throttle all the way forwards and sends them hurtling past a slowly spinning asteroid that comes sailing up from somewhere below them. He's desperately trying to keep his focus on everything that's happening, on swerving around pieces of debris that would tear through them in an instant, calculating how much he needs to course-correct when Osiren shudders out pulsating waves of energy, 
But it's hard to do when Rambu keeps muttering frantically under his breath next to him. Ancients. Oh, ancients. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. No, it's not. No, it's not. Oh, ancients, we're going to d die. We're not going to die. Tubbo bites out, pulling back on the yoke and narrowly avoiding two pieces of asteroid that collide together, cutting back quickly through the small shards they send flying, some banging into the Asachi and making Ronbu wail. Ancients, we're, we're dead. We're gonna die. We're not gonna die. Tubbo yells heatedly, miscalculating how much thrust he needs to use to ride out the next shockwave. The Asachi quaking around them as it's battered by solar energy, accidentally sends them smashing into a chunk of molten asteroid, and he smacks a palm into an armrest at the new round of alarms that set off. Are you insane? There's no way we're going to survive this. Rambu hollers, throwing out a trembling hand to wave erratically at the shitfest in front of them. I d don't care what you, you think. N no one can make this. Oh, ancients, that is, this is it. I, I, I don't want to die. Can you calm down? Tubbo screams, but a snarling blast from a siren hits them then and Rambu's stumbling stream of panic warps into a desperately scared wail that grates on Tubbo's antenna, hands white knuckling around the controls as Rambu yowls. Please, ancients, I, I don't want to die. Please, ancients, I, I'm so scared. I, what do we do? What do we, what do we, what do we do? What do we do? Will you just shut the fuck up for once in your life? Tubbo screeches, hits the throttle backwards too hard, and hears Ronbu choke as he's jerked forwards, takes a deep breath, and tries to calm his frayed nerves. He says, with vicious conviction, as he flies through a whole field of rocketing debris, We're not gonna die. I'm going to get us out of this, so just shut up and trust me. Adrenaline is coursing through him like lightning, making all the hair on his body stand up on end. Heart beating like it's trying to escape his ribcage, and Tubbo's hands are steady on the controls because he can do this. He knows he can do this. And mercifully, Rambu decides to believe him. Or maybe he just passes out. But he's finally quiet, and that's all Tubbo could ask for. Osiren is nearing the ending stages of its explosion, lights suddenly receding around them as it collapses inwards into a swirling core of bright orange and Tebo bites the inside of his cheek hard, knows they only have a few minutes before it expands rapidly. They're so close to the edge of the blast radius. Tebo dares a glance up at one of his readouts, calculating in his head how much longer they have, and it's going to be so close. He's only got one shot. Has to do this perfectly. One breath in, one breath out, hands flexing around the controls, and Tebo moves. The engines are a comforting rumble around him, their whining pitch rising and falling as he moves the throttle forwards, like a great beast inhaling and exhaling, the smooth glide of machinery trembling in the air like well-trained muscles, responding to Tubbo's touch without any hesitation. He knows this ship, knows it like an extension of himself, and it knows him, has never failed him before and it doesn't now moving exactly as Tubbo wants it to. There was only his heart beating fast, but steady in his ears, a grounding vibration like the Asachi working beautifully under him, hands sure around the yoke, controlled on the throttle, guiding them through the ever-changing minefield in front of him, his mind working quick and calculating trajectories faster than the rocks can move, gliding past everything in dizzying spirals. They clear the threshold at the last possible second, fiery light searing out behind them as Osiren enters the last stage of its explosion, knocking the Asachi forwards with a tidal wave of blistering heat and radiation, and sends them careening through space with a dozen alarms blaring. Tebo fights for control back, but it's almost impossible, the force of the detonation ripping the yoke from his hands, and they're mercilessly pelted with shards of shrapnel as they spin uncontrollably. Tebo can hear the emergency bulkhead doors clang into place, 
Cutting them off from the cargo hold, which isn't good, means the hole's been breached somewhere. And he finally gets control over the yoke, spins them around fast, and flings the throttle all the way down, flooding the engines with fuel. If they've taken a hit, doesn't matter how big, he can't jump to light speed. It'd only blow it open more and compromise the Asachi. But he's got to get them out of here before the radiation leaking out of Osiren cooks them alive. Typing on a hollow screen, one-handed, Tubbo pulls up a list of nearby inhabitable planets and planetoids, settles on the closest one with an atmosphere, and guns it in that direction. He does his best to dodge debris, but they're so small now it's hard to move past them, and a few more strike hard against the Asachi's hull. It doesn't sound like any more holes are blasted open, and it's the small mercies that count the most right now. Like when the dusty little planet finally comes into view. Tubbo frantically begins the process for entering its atmosphere, prays silently they're not going to burn up on re-entry, and darts a quick glance at Ronbu, who, to his surprise, is still conscious, though he's got a weird ashy color. He's staring straight ahead, with his hands gripped on the armrests, claws Tubbo hadn't noticed before, gouging into the material, tail going absolutely ballistic as it snaps and curls through the air, sending all the gold dangling from his ears swaying around erratically. Of all the people I might die beside, Tubbo thinks with a streak of dark amusement, turns back to the viewport and eases them down through the thermosphere. More alarms pop up instantly, warning him of overheating, and Tubbo dismisses all of them with a quick flick of his wrist, grits his teeth at the distressing rattling the Asachi starts making, his heart aching for his ship. Just a little longer. Please, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, but just a little further. But Tubbo is a good pilot, and the Asachi is a good ship, and it gets them down to the planet's surface alive, touching down less than graceful in the first clear spot of land Tubbo can find, settling with creaking groans as gravity aggravates all of its hurts. Tubbo's quick to kill the engines, just in case there's a fuel leak anywhere and they sit in the ringing silence as they power down, faint pinging coming from the metal hull as it begins to cool, both of them breathing harshly in the cockpit, and Tubbo turns to look at Ronbu the same time he turns to him. His eyes are blown wide, pupils contracted all the way into razor-thin slits from panic, but his mouth twitches, panting breaths huffing out in some semblance of deranged laughter as he looks at Tubbo in awe. A dark tongue darts out to wet his lips, and then he croaks in a hoarse voice edged with manic relief. Ancients of the deep, you, you, you did it. He sounds so flabbergasted, absolutely flummoxed that they survived. Tubbo can't help but bark out a tremulous laugh, collapses back against his chair as the terror finally hits him body shaking uncontrollably as he wheezes. <laughs> Told you. An excerpt from the Declassified Galactic Survival Guide Out of every galactic entity to run across, the Imperial Sunfleet is not the worst by any means, unless you oppose them in some way, or carry out any activities deemed illegal by the Sun Emperor which runs the gamut from not paying taxes to the Empire to obnoxiously obvious slave trafficking. Punishments for such transgressions come in vast range depending on which branch of the fleet it is that has detained you, along with how frisky the commanding officers are feeling, but have been known to include indefinite incarceration in one of the many Imperial prisons, along with incinerating your entire ship on the spot. For this reason alone, your author suggests that if being pursued by any craft bearing the Sunfleet emblem, to just keep going, and hope you can outrun them. Because if not, running from Imperial officers is an incinerable offence, and one that's hard to make a comeback from. While your author does say this to frighten you, it is by no means meant to be a deterrent to travelling the stars, one of the most rewarding and hazardous experiences any being should definitely partake in but is meant to act as a mere piece of cautionary advice to steer you in the right direction. Survival in deep space can be tricky for the unwary, 
which is why this book was created, to help the reader, hopefully you, better navigate these obstacles by providing a comprehensible understanding of every culture and group the author, me, had the pleasure and displeasure of meeting before my likely untimely demise. But besides this book, the most important thing to have when navigating the interstellar swamp that calls itself our reality is, and it is not actually a towel, like some other experts on the subject of writing long-winded and rambling books about the universe might have suggested, but rather something much more simple. The best resource you could ever have with you in the dark, cold beyond of space is simply someone there with you, a partner you'd trust with your own life. Might have to on many occasions, because just the knowledge that there's someone with you, that you're not having to face all of this alone, is what will get you through anything.